I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done to develop brain imaging based biomarkers for pain in hopes that it'll serve as food for thought. And so I'm going to end the talk with questions. But first, pain is the primary reason why people seek medical attention. And it is a symptom and a disease in its own right that cuts across diagnostic boundaries, fields of medicine, and walks of daily life. Uh, in fact, 100 million adults in the US alone suffer from persistent pain of some form, which is about a third of the population, which is a staggering number. There's been a lot written about its estimated economic uh, costs, and all told, it's on the order of, uh, of a US military budget type <laughs> of cost, uh, and lost productivity and work, as well as direct care costs. Uh, the problem of chronic pain is getting worse, not better, over time, rather dramatically in the US. It's intertwined with legal issues, which I know very little amount about, but I'm hoping that Amanda Postelnik will enlighten us on more. Uh, issues related to uh, who gets disability status, uh, who gets VA benefits, who gets workers' compensation, um, who uh, gets compensated for injury or wrongdoing, um, who gets insurance coverage, who gets Medicare coverage, uh, and um, which kinds of treatments count as uh, insurance reimbursable treatments for chronic pain. And in various ways, these answers to these questions depend on uh, whether you have pain, how severe the pain is, and really on something that we can't get a good handle on empirically very easily, which is what caused it and whose fault is it? If somebody experiences chronic pain, sometimes people think it's their fault. <laughs> uh, and uh, many others would, would disagree. What kinds of predispositions does one have and what kinds of obligations does one have uh, to prevent or mitigate the cause of pain? One of our central problems is that the primary way that people report pain, the only currently acceptable way of reporting pain still, is something like this 1 to 10 numerical rating scale. Uh, the problem is if you report a 7 out of 10 on that scale, that's actually a very complex outcome. That's influenced by your prior beliefs, no susceptive processes carrying pain signaling information from the body, uh, emotional experiences that you might have surrounding the pain. Uh, pain is reported in a context, so it depends on who you're talking to as well, and what you'd like to communicate to them about your need for help. Uh, and of course then, I like to say that pain, um, those pain reports are communicative behaviors. They're made in a social context, in a cultural context. Uh, and that makes them very hard to study because it's very difficult to imagine a miracle biological cure for what you would report, you know, anything, something you'd report that depends on your social context <laughs> and, your, and your cultural background and so forth. Uh, so at the very least, um, this is a huge obstacle to treatment development. It is also linked to a well-documented literature on health disparities in pain diagnosis and pain care. Uh, I think there are many causes for these things, but this certainly contributes uh, to the fact that if you are a woman in America, or if you're African American, you uh, have to report more pain to get the same level of treatment. You're less likely to be referred to a pain specialist, more likely to be given a urine drug screen, and sent to drug rehab and counseling. Um, <clears throat> less likely to be given opioids, uh, which is maybe actually a good thing, all told. Um, so many sources of, of bias. Um, but this is a 20 minute talk, <laughs> so I'm gonna move on. Uh, the neurophysiology of pain in 30 seconds. There are at least five major ascending pathways, which I've shown here in blue. They reach targets at multiple levels of the neuraxis, from the brainstem up to the prefrontal cortex, which is the sometimes thought of as the seat of higher level cognition. Uh, we used to think that pain was really all about those ascending pathways. And actually, many people in the field still do. 80 to 90% of pain research is about the periphery uh, and the spinal cord. Uh, only a small fraction has anything to do with any of the stuff on this, this picture now. Um, but the this, this stuff that is about this picture uh, has shown us 
that these ascending pathways are subject to descending control from uh, higher order brain systems like the medial prefrontal cortex that you see here in yellow. Um, those projections coming back down target those areas and alter uh, uh, what's happening in them, um, including maintaining, facilitating pain behavior in animal models. So you can create an animal model where there's persistent pain and you can show that it's both caused and fixed by changes that happen in the brain itself, which I'll get to later. Um, there's a rich pharmacology that we really just barely scratched the surface of, and it's almost too complex to consider actually trying to study uh, and do something about. Um, but lots of targets. So uh, how do we turn this into biomarkers? Well, in spite of all of this work on the causes and the consequences of pain over decades, it's a, a, very rich literature, um, we have still very little idea about what it is in the brain that uh, is proximally linked to the generation of pain. What causes it? Um, where can we intervene? What can we do about it? Is there a brain readout of pain? <laughs> uh, we still don't know. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to use patterns of brain activity measured with fMRI imaging uh, as a putative <coughs> biomarker. Um, so it's something that uh, can be elicited by a noxious event and something that is linked to the mental experience and ultimately what we can measure, the self-report of pain. So we have these patterns of brain activity um, which we think are, are uh, measuring aspects of pain or contributors to pain. At a very minimum, uh, any measure of something, including pain, should be sensitive and specific to the process that it's intended to measure. Now that doesn't mean that we've discovered the representation of pain in the brain, um, but what it does mean is that we have a starting point, something that is uh, diagnostic to some degree. Um, so one of the issues that intersects with the law is about what the standards ev of evidence are and what they should be. And I believe that we are going to really have to change the way we think about the intersection between research uh, in science and in the law. Because I think that judges and lawyers and legal scholars really are going to need to be able to get their heads wrapped around what is it, what, you know, what is the science show, what is sensitivity and specificity and when does it apply and when do things generalize and when don't they, et cetera. And one example um, uh, is, well, it, <laughs> it has its roots actually here at, at Columbia in the, in the imaging center here, in part. <laughs> um, so this is a case of, of Carl Koch, who's a, who was a, um, his arm was burned by a glob of molten asphalt. Uh, I think he was driving a truck, I can't remember. Um, then he ended up, like many people, in, in chronic pain, and he sued his uh, employer. Um, and the lawyers on this case brought in uh, Joy Hirsch, who was here at Columbia at the time, and she conducted this brain scan here. This is a picture of Carl Cox's brain. Uh, the blobs are activation in the brain due to brushing of the arm, uh, which um, Carl said was painful, so that's uh, allodynia. Um, so it's brushing the squeeze ball. That, so that's, you know, this brain map here that you see is consistent with those claims of pain. Um, this is never, no link between this particular map or things like this map in pain has ever been published. Um, but Dr. Hirsch argued that such claims are really not necessary, that sensory mapping, brushing and squeezing the ball, is already validated as a technique, <laughs> as is fMRI, and therefore uh, validated for neurosurgical mapping, and therefore this evidence is good enough. Uh, on the other side, actually, um, I think it's not on my slide, but uh, Sean Mackey is an, a pain physician from Stanford who came in on the other side and argued that this might have been consistent with imagining pain too. Um, and Dr. Uh, Hirsch says, now I don't think it is in my expert opinion. <laughs> uh, so this was ultimately admitted uh, based on this combination of principles. fMRI is generally validated um, and, uh, and um, Joy Hirsch is expert testimony. Um, so which is interesting, this did have an impact on the outcome we believe, which is that this case settled for $800,000 without um, you know, going forward further. Um, and so it, you know, the admission of this evidence probably did make a difference. Um, okay, 
So that's a starting point for reasoning about what are the problems with these arguments, if there are any. OK, so I'll do it this way. This is uh, a real brain map from 30 uh, people. This was done in my lab, so this is a group map. Um, yellow blobs are increases in activity during a task. Um, blues are decreases. And the real question is, what does this map mean? So if you're a good neurophysiologist, you ought to be able to, uh, to just tell me, what are they doing in this task? Well, you have to read off the image and you say, okay, well, there's the anterior cingulate cortex, that's consistent with pain. There's, uh, there's the insula and operculum, that's consistent with pain, that's nociceptive. There's the medial thalamus, ah, nociceptive afferents there, that's consistent with pain. Some amount of sensory cortex, pain, pain. Um, you can do better, you can take this map and plug it into a tool called neurosynth.org, which Talia Arconi built in my lab while he was a postdoc there. Um, what you see here are now coordinates from 10,000 different individual imaging studies of all kinds of different things. Um, task performance of all kinds. Um, and then you can say, okay, uh, when papers produce activity peaks like this one, what are those papers talking about? Because he's got the full text of the papers too. Top hits here are noxious heat, some sensory painful sensation stimulation, muscle temperature. So you go, aha, now we've made this inference that, yep, this looks a lot like a pain map. The problem is, this is not a map of pain. This is a map of what happens when you look at somebody who rejected you in love. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a lot like pain at first pass. <laughs> which I'll agree with, but the problem is a lot of things look like pain-related brain activity if you blur your eyes enough, right, when you look at those images. So the problem is that the areas that are the most strongly associated with pain, the anterior cingulate and insula, for example, um, they are not specific to any type of affect. Well, why not? Because every voxel that we measure with neuroimaging, a few cubic millimeters, um, has about 500, five and a half million neurons in it. And those neurons do different things. Uh, including in the anterior cingulate, for example, they respond to painful events and they do play a causal role in pain avoidance. <laughs> but there's millions of other neurons in there that do different things. So if you look at the base rate of what's the most active places in the brain across any study that you can pretty much imagine, think of doing in the literature, the anterior cingulate and the insula are two out of the top three most activated places. And in fact, we've had a few debates on this in the literature, so this is uh, related to one of them. Uh, if you look at one of the most pain-selective areas of the anterior cingulate cortex, that's that little spot there that I've circled, and then you can look back and say, well, what are all the different studies in the literature that have activated that spot? And what you find is they're pretty much all over the place. So pain, yes, and touch, and language, attention, motor, memory, learning, decision making, etc. So if you see activity in that spot, you can't infer that pain was happening. There could be a lot of things happening. Okay. Um, so we've been thinking a lot about this, and we've been thinking about the criteria required to actually make that kind of inference. That given this brain map, it's pretty likely that somebody was in pain. And uh, this is a consensus paper uh, that Amanda and I wrote with a whole group of people. Um, it was a lot of fun, actually, I have to say, at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to share a couple of points from that, that long paper related to standards of evidence. Where did they go? <laughs> okay, they're there. Um, so the first thing that you have to have to, to treat something as a biomarker is you have to have a precisely defined measure that you can apply to new individuals and validate that measure. Think about the map of Carl Koch, who Joy Hirsch scanned. That's not a measure. How do you, it's blobs all over the brain. How do you know? What, how do you apply that to a new person? You can't. There is no measure. It is an expert read, right? So that's the old way of doing uh, imaging and radiology. Expert looks at the scan, they go, yep, I think that's a tumor, <laughs> right? And that's kind of been our standard. Um, but that's not going to work when uh, the mapping between pain and brain is as complex as this. So uh, that, you know, the Koch case doesn't even meet this first criteria. 
Um, secondly, it has to be replicated and applied without changing it, without redefining the marker and the measure uh, across laboratories, across different types of pain and populations. It's got to be sensitive and specific to pain. That means it responds when pain is present, and it doesn't respond when pain is not present. It's something else. Uh, and it has to be generalizable to multiple different patient groups. It's got to work for, for, for people that you want to apply it to. You know, if it's people from different cultures, it's got to apply to people from different cultures. If it's a particular patient groups, it's got to apply to those patient groups, and you know that it, it, it can work for them. So all of these validation steps. Um, and this is, this is essentially why the, the pharma R&D budget uh, is something like $90 billion a year, actually more now. <laughs> because it's really hard <laughs> to go through all these steps. It requires greater and greater levels of evidence. So the idea that we've been pursuing is first of all to identify a potential marker that's optimized here, generalize, test the heck out of it across people, across labs, scanners, populations, variants of pain, etc. cetera. Um, and in doing so, characterize its boundary conditions. What activates it, what doesn't activate it? How much of the time does it pick up on pain? Uh, how much of, it, of the time does it reject things that are not pain but that might otherwise be confusable? Um, and ultimately, um, what we're trying to do is a process called construct validation. We're trying to, which many of you are familiar with, we're trying to, we have a measure, we're trying to understand what does it actually measure. Let's define that empirically. Um, now this is a difficult process. Um, I think that it requires increasing levels of evidence as you take it closer and closer to translational use. And this is the same process that the uh, biomarker development pipeline goes through with you know, skin punch biopsies or other measures. Okay. Um, so here is an attempt in our hands to identify a measure for evoked pain. Um, this is, it turns out, not a measure of all kinds of clinical pain. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, but we can talk more about that. The idea is we take a training sample of individuals. Each person gets noxious heat on their arm, so painful heat, four different levels. Uh, we look at all the reports and we're trying to build a brain model that can predict how much pain each person felt. So we get a pattern of weights. It's a brain map. And um, we can apply that to new data, as I'll, I'll show you. So this is an optimized map that captures pain predictive activity. We call this the neurologic pain signature uh, because the journal editors asked that we do that, um, and it involves lots of areas of the brain that you would expect that have no susceptive neurons in them. Um, but it's the exact patterns in those areas that are important, not just that we have activity somewhere in the anterior cingulate cortex. So we can apply that to new set samples, one person at a time, uh, apply that pattern just means taking a weighted average, and that turns a complex brain map into a single number, which is the predicted pain in that condition for that individual. Uh, and so when we do that for a new study, this is what we see for three levels of noxious heat. Each line is a person. You can see they increase generally, and the slopes are positive. So if we took the high and the low conditions, which are two degrees different, in this case, in temperature, and we had to make a choice based on the brain, which is more painful, we'd get it right about 96% of the time in this sample. And that's been our, our benchmark, as I'll, I'll show you. Okay. Um, so one of the issues that we have in the field is lots of people are using similar predictive models. We didn't make this up. <laughs> um, increasing numbers. We just reviewed almost 500 studies that attempt to build brain-based classifiers for all kinds of disorders. Um, you can see Alzheimer's is really well represented here. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go through this quickly, but um, the idea is in every disease category, you can find studies that have almost 100% accuracy. That's on the y-axis here, at telling who's a patient and who's a control. That's pretty good news. The, the larger the circle, by the way, the bigger the study. Some of these studies have about 1,000 people or more at this point. So that's great. Uh, but we have, among other problems, what um, my old colleague Walter Michel, who was here for many years and just passed away, um, used to call the toothbrush problem. So in honor of Walter, <laughs> the toothbrush problem is nobody wants to use somebody else's. <laughs> so you have 500 different studies, 500 different models, and nobody's testing anybody else's. 
Try to take a guess in your head at the percentage of those papers, even with the big thousand person studies, that replicated that exactly on a new sample to say, does it really work? Zero. zero. <laughs> nope. Oh, not zero. It's less than 10% though. It's pretty bad. Not that bad, right? But in the studies that do perspective tests, their accuracy is a lot lower. There's a lot of bias in literature. It's going to be a very complicated space to wade through <laughs> as we start to do this. All right, with our pain measures, we have shared data with people now across the world from multiple places, from here, from other, other places, um, and we're learning a lot about what this particular measure measures. Um, I'll show you a couple drops. This is one that was just published, actually. I didn't change the date. Uh, and it is 20 studies across the world. Each of those rows is a study um, of pain and placebo effects. So the first thing I'll show you is across 600 people from 20 sites, does our pain measure respond to pain? And it does. In fact, it responds correctly in 95% of the people we tested across all the sites. <laughs> Without any optimization, it's got a huge effect size. There are multiple types of pain, all evoked pain. So that's an example of generalizability. And we're learning uh, now about um, the things that activate this, which is essentially multiple types of evoked painful somatic stimuli. Uh, more of these are published now, too. Um, uh, and treatments. So if you get an opioid, and SSRI and several different kinds of psychological manipulations, but not all, as I'll show you, uh, we can influence this, symbol, this signal. So it's responsive to treatment um, when treatment is effective. What you might be asking yourself now is, what does this thing really measure? It could be some specific subtypes of pain, multiple types of somatic pain, or maybe just anything negative, anything arousing, anything salient. This has to do with how specific that signal is. So how do we test specificity? Well, we have to find things that are aversive, arousing, and salient, but that are not pain. And for that, we'll turn back to rejection, which is an experience that happens early in life. Uh, experiences often last a lifetime. This man is going to propose to his girlfriend on television at a basketball game. And if you're an empathetic person, you might feel something in your stomach. <laughs> There she goes. She's gone. Okay. There we go. We got 60 people who were all rejected uh, in love. Um, this is Ethan Cross did this here at Columbia. Uh, they all viewed pictures of ex-partners and friends, and they experienced painful and painful heat. So if this were me, I would experience be seeing a close friend and an ex-partner. Um, not really. Those are not my friends and ex-partners. Right, and then they get rejection and pain, which are very similar in terms of what people report, and I've showed you before, very similar in terms of overall brain activity. So now we can do a validation test, positive control. Does it respond, the measure respond to painful heat? Yes, it does. Pain signature responds. Does it respond to the rejector? No, it doesn't. You can see there might be a little bit of a response, but if you look at what happens with real pain in red versus non-painful warmth in orange, and then the rejector and the friend photos, there's nothing that looks close to physical pain. And we've tested its specificity now in many different ways across multiple studies, published studies and unpublished, and um, it doesn't respond to lots of aversive, arousing things. A couple more bits, a couple more minutes. What about countermeasures? That's important. We haven't really touched that yet. Uh, here's one test. Can you think this thing up and down? So we studied emotion regulation here for quite a while, and this was um, partly a test of whether people can really think the signature up and down. So in some conditions, we asked people to imagine this is burning, bubbling, sizzling, terrible, and other blocks of trials, cool, warm blanket on a cool day, spreading over your body, accept it. People's pain reports went up and down accordingly in yellow and blue. Uh, what about pain signature? Again, we can see an increase in, with response to the, the temperature of the heat itself, but no effect of self-regulation. And now we'll turn back to the placebo studies, 20 studies around the world. Uh, every study, except for I think one, had a significant placebo effect. You get a fake drug and you report less pain. So pretty moderate effect size, it's pretty good. What about the brain? There's almost no response. It's a significant response, 
has a reduction at a tiny effect size. So maybe some people some of the time, <laughs> um, but overall tiny. Um, so we can add other kinds of treatments down here that don't uh, produce any modulation of this signal. They all affect pain reports, including cognitive modulation, placebo, perceived control, manipulations, reward, and social cues. Okay, last bits. Thanks for humoring me for one more minute. There's been a huge trend in the field towards central sensitization as a partial explanation for, for chronic pain. So sensitization in the, in the spinal cord and in the brain. And this map shows you multiple places. Every place with a red lightning bolt is a place where in animal studies of persistent pain after injury, neural sensitization occurs and in many cases plays a causal role in maintaining pain. So there's actually a surprising number of locations. And if we can fix pain in animals so often, why can't we fix it in humans? <laughs> I don't know yet, it's complicated. There are not just one pathway then, but there are multiple mechanisms and pathways. Um, so that's good news and bad news, uh, um, in the sense that um, you know, there really isn't one measure for pain. There's multiple measures of neurophysiological systems that contribute to pain. That's the bad news. Good news is we have lots of targets. Uh, one quick application to fibromyalgia research, um, which is, some, is a, a condition with widespread pain and multiple sensitivities where people are often not believed, even today, by pain experts in some cases. Um, so what we can say is when we give people fresher pain in the scanner, controls less fibromyalgia patients, stronger response in pain-related signals, pain signature. So that validates that, yeah, at least a portion of these people are, ex are showing the same kinds of brain signals consistent with their pain reports. In fact, the response is as strong as the controls with a much higher level of stimulation. But that's only part of the story. So this hypersensitivity in the pattern that I've been showing you, that mediates evoked hypersensitivity, so more sensitivity to pressure. That's one feature of fibromyalgia. But there are other brain changes in the prefrontal cortex and in response to non-painful uh, sounds and motor tasks and basic visual stimuli that are actually correlated with other aspects of pain, including sp clinical and sp spontaneous clinical pain. So if you put those things together, we can tell who's got fibromyalgia with 93% accuracy in this sample in a fair test. So we can differentiate patients and controls. But one measure correlates with allodynia on the scanner hypersensitivity, a different measure correlates with depression and functional impairment, and a third measure correlates with spontaneous clinical pain. So there'll be multiple brain targets for multiple uh, uh, different symptoms. Okay. Um, I'm gonna end now with, just with a couple of questions for thought. Um, when is it okay to trust a biological measure as a surrogate in a legal setting? I don't know the answers to these questions. What do we need to actually do to, to convince people uh, or make it okay? Um, if people can't report, like infants, we have commonly assumed that infants don't feel pain because they can't tell us that they feel pain. Uh, this still goes on today to some degree. Um, so what kinds of biological indicators do we need? Um, can we ever falsify pain and say, nope, your brain doesn't show the pain signal, <laughs> right? I think that's very dangerous. Um, I'm not sure if there's ever a case for it. Um, if, if we can't falsify pain, what can we say about a person? <laughs> Uh, who says they're in pain, but we can't find it. Typical signals in the brain. And last question, can there be unconscious pain? Uh, and another way of saying that is, why does it matter what you subjectively feel? Um, is it really much more important what your body and brain are doing and what the lasting impact of that is? So if you get surgery, for example, and you don't remember feeling any pain, you didn't feel any pain, but your brain and body are messed up <laughs> long term, which is more important. Maybe that's the more important thing than the subjective experience. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your attention.